for the assurance that you are now here with us, our God, waiting to bless us and to bring to our living such a sense of joy and peace and purpose as earth can never give. Yours is a faithfulness that does not change or diminish with the passing of the ages. Yours a love expressed in Jesus at which we can only marvel. There is, Lord, no one like you in heaven or upon the earth to whom we should go with our prayers and our praising. So let the glory be yours, our God, this day and all days through Jesus Christ our Lord. Heavenly Father, our lives and all our ways are like an open book before you. There is nothing that we can hide from you. And with humility we recall those things in which daily we come short of the standard set by us for Jesus, by Jesus. The spirit of true charity motivates, motivates us only fitfully. Concern for ourselves crowds out the compassion we should feel for others. The things of the faith seldom occupy the central ground of our thinking. We sometimes live and act as if you were not here at all. And so we ask you to have mercy upon us, forgive us all our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and bring us to the everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And be now, great God, the guide and inspirer of our lives. Attune our minds and hearts to the word that you give for our living. Take from these moments here all preoccupation with lesser things, that we may find the answers we seek and the dedication we need to live now and always in your glory. And we pray these things through the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Saviour, our King, our Friend. Amen. And now we turn to the Word and I ask the readers to please come forward. Oh, and... Uh, I got a wave from a lovely lady at the back. It wasn't a, a greeting. It was to remind me that the Sunday school children must now go to can now go to Sunday school. Thanks. Would the reader come, sir? Surely. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Shirley. Please pray with me. Lord, thank you for the privilege of being in your house this morning and for this beautiful day. Please open our minds and hearts, ears and eyes to hear what you have to say to us, that we may encourage others. We ask this in your precious and wonderful name, Jesus Christ, our Saviour and Lord. Amen. Our first reading is taken from Deuteronomy 6 of the Old Testament and will be found on page 200 in the Pew Bible. Love the Lord your God. These are the commands, decrees, and laws Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess, so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live, by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you, so that you may enjoy long life. Hear, O Israel, and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you, and then you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. The Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. morning is from the New Testament. You'll find it on page 248 of the Pew Bible. Qualifications for overseers and deacons. Here is a trustworthy saying, whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task, 
Now the overseer is above reproach, faithful to his wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him, and he must do so in a manner worthy of full respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders, so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. May God bless to us these readings from his holy word, and to his name be glory and praise this day and forevermore. And folks, in that reading, if it says here, is a trustworthy saying, if anyone sets his heart on being an overseer, uh, substitute that for minister, and you will see that the demands on the life and character of a minister, as I set by the New Testament, are extremely high. Um, as you know, Michelle is preaching, has arranged a series of five uh, teachings during this month, and this um, this month, this series that I've been handed um, in a manual, which um, is kind of very specific in what it wants you to say, and and um, I'm I'm in I'm in new territory here. I'm I'm not free to be me, and so. I'm, I'm more nervous than I uh, usually am, and, and I ask your indulgence. Um, and basically, the, the teaching and the, the, the lesson is on two um, pledges that you're asked to make. And the, the first one is, uh, in brief, I will pray for my minister. And here he suggests that, and, and of course, every minister needs prayer. A minister's life is not an easy one, with each day bringing with it new challenges and demands, especially if, like Michelle, you love Jesus and are committed and dedicated to your calling. And incidentally, I think it's uh, as well that Michelle is not here today, because um, the, the thing calls for us to talk about her, and, and she doesn't like to be talked about. And that sets me free to, to say what I want about Michelle. So that's great. Uh, but uh, it... it uh, and at the, back of the, the, at the back of your pew leaflet, there's a pledge that you're asked to make. And, and it says, uh, the third pledge, I will pray for my minister and elders every day. I understand that their work is never ending. Their days are filled with numerous demands that bring emotional highs and lows. Because my minister and elders cannot do all things in their own power, I will pray for their strength and wisdom daily. But it says their days are filled with numerous demands that bring emotional highs and lows. Boy, and that is so of a minister. But this, this teaching today requires us to pray for the minister in three specific areas. And the first one of these is we are asked to pray for the preaching of the minister. I wondered about that, but, but it's logical. It's logical for us to pray for Michelle and her preaching. Guys, let me tell you out of experience that it's an awesome responsibility to stand in this pulpit and talk about God. Every Sunday morning the people of God, you, come into God's house to meet with God and we preachers have to meet that need. Now I've never felt that I was worthy of that calling or that I was good enough for that calling. But it's an awesome responsibility. I've been a preacher now for 44 years, and, this, and the, the pulpit that I first preached in was in my home church in Springs, in the St. Michael's Presbyterian Church in Springs, and it had an ornate, an ornate pulpit. Uh, you came out of the elders' vestry here, and it was on the left-hand side, and you came out of the elders' vestry, and when you entered the pulpit, there was a little two steps on the, on the, le on the side that you entered. Then you got to a little platform, and you looked up, and you, and you then entered it. And right in eyesight, and this, friends, was before there were such things as women preachers and women ministers, but right in your eyesight were these words, Sir, we would see Jesus. And that's the challenge every minister has in a Christian pulpit, 
to bring Jesus to the people. And it's also. This man suggests that when you pray for Michelle, you should pray for that she would have wisdom, insight, and words. And the pressure that comes from being a minister and having to preach season in and season out, day in and Sunday out, is enormous. Michelle sometimes relieves that pressure by inviting guest preachers. But at the end of the day, the bulk of the preaching is done by Michelle. She's probably been the pastor here now for something like 12 years. And I wonder how many sermons Michelle has had to preach in that time. It's, a, it's terribly demanding. And the minister has to preach, irrespective of the circumstances. Michelle was saying to me how difficult it can sometimes be. She said, like when you conduct the funeral of a young person on a Friday afternoon who happens to have been a friend of yours, <laughs> and you're sad, and you're emotional. And Sunday morning, you've got to stand in the pulpit and tell people about the, the lovely and the caring and the wonderful Jesus. It's hard, folks. It's very hard. I think that the key to being a, even a decent preacher, never mind a good one and a great one, is locked into one word, and that's preparation. And preparation, when it's, when it's well done, is time-consuming. Time-consuming. And one of the things, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to know that when Michelle gets in this pulpit, she is well prepared. And we need to be very grateful for that. And it's not easy. It's time consuming. It's something you have to find time for, even in the busiest of schedules. And that's not always easy, and it requires discipline. Michelle sets aside Thursdays for sermon presentation, for preparation. She works from home, where it's quiet, and she's surrounded by her computer and her reference materials. And there she devotes herself to the preparing Sunday sermon. And that's great, except that sometimes it doesn't work out quite like that. She's just getting underway and things are beginning to flow in her cell phone rings. She's been visiting a family where the mother is ill for the past two months. It's the daughter on the phone, distraught. Michelle, she says, my mother has just died. What does Michelle do? Say, well, you know, I'm busy now and I'm, I'm looked in my diary and I can clear a spot on Friday afternoon at four to see you. No ways, she's a pastor. She drops everything jumps in a motor car and rushes to that family where she comforts them, she consoles them, she counsels them and she prays for them. She's the minister. This family have lost a loved one. They are distraught. And so she spends time with them. She talks with them. She talks about the future. She talks about the funeral. She often is the person, the first person to phone the undertakers. But she's a pastor, and those people need their pastor, and Michelle spends her time there. Two hours later, she's finished, so she gets in the car, and she's driving home because she has to finish a sermon. And while she's in the car, her cell phone goes again, and it's Pam from the church, her secretary. She says, Michelle, I've just had a call from Mr. So-and-so's family to say that he's had a heart attack. And he's in the ICU unit at Gateway. So what does Michelle do? She drives off to the Gateway Hospital. But folks, back at the ranch, the sermon has got to be preached on Sunday. And, and that's the, and, and this is, I'm just taking a, I'm not taking a real life situation. But that's the kind of, of, of pressure that the preacher is placed under. And that's why you need to pray. I'm not sure if there's anything tougher than being a preacher. And especially when you are as committed to being a minister as Michelle is. My experience of the Presbyterian ministers, there are only two kinds. There's the kind that does as little work as possible, 
and there's the kind, like Michelle, who do more work and work as hard, more hard, harder than they ought to. And those hard-working ones have great pressure placed upon the minister to preach. So, yeah, the first prayer that this man makes, and I urge you to do, is to pray for Michelle to cover her in her preaching. Then the, this man tells us that we must talk about the family, because most ministers are married. And he asks us to pray for the minister's family. Michelle's family lives in P.E., where she has parents who love her and who fully support her in the ministry. And she, understandably, goes there as often as she can, where she can put her feet up, just chill, recharge her batteries. And ministers, like everyone else, need a break from time to time. I had an arrangement with my session in Pretoria that whenever there was a fifth Sunday in a month, and I think there were four in a year, that that was my weekend off. And Julie and I would occasionally just get out of Pretoria, go check into a hotel, and spend a weekend doing nothing. Going to movies, going to have a meal. Uh, Saturday afternoon was reserved for me in to lie on my bed and watch the Blue Bulls win. But, uh, <laughs> um, and they need that. And they need families. And, Ju Ju and, <laughs> and Julie was a wonderful, wonderful support for me. And Michelle needs that and she gets that at home. But unfortunately, she, or not unfortunately, but the fact is, Michelle is a single lady and she lives alone at home. She, uh, she has a, no family, she has a bicycle and, and uh, fortunately, fortunately she has a group of supportive friends in the church who pray for her, support her, her. and friends you, you pray. Pray for her family and her friends. Pray that they will always be there for her a shoulder to cry on, a hug that says I love you, to pick her up when she's down. And this minister is quite right when we need the support of a family, or if not a family, a, a direct family, then our church family, to support the minister who has that tough, tough job for him. And then this program uh, asks church members to pray for protection of their ministers against the wiles of Satan. And that's a valid call because every minister who has ever lived is a human being. And every human being who ever lived is fallible and vulnerable. Now you all know that Michelle is a good and a kind and a caring person. And she's a very good minister. But she's not perfect. She's not perfect. She, like all of us, makes mistakes. She gets things wrong. She can say something in a sermon to which someone takes umbrage. She can upset someone by doing something that upsets them. She can disappoint someone by saying she will do something and then forgetting to do it. And these things happen, friends, because Michelle is a human being. And one of the things that we have to understand, and this man is saying, is that we must not allow it to cause friction. We must sort it out as soon as possible. Over the years, I've served in presbytery commissions where a minister and, some, and, and either a member or some of the members, there has been a rift. And sometimes it is turned so ugly, it's unbelievable. And the only thing that happens there is that the church is torn asunder. Some support the minister, some support the... And there's just a, a ding-dong and it's ugly and it's divisive. And you know what it does? It destroys the work of the church. We must never allow that to happen. If you have an issue with Michelle, sort it out. Sort it out. The Bible in the New Testament clearly often teaches us that the church, that we are to love and forgive and be reconciled to each other. I was recently in Hermanus and I came across a, on a church door. This church was situated in a shopping mall and they had obviously a facility upstairs, but next to the, the coffee shop where we were having coffee, they had a glass door. And on this door, uh, the church had written these words, we love Hermanus dearly, we love God passionately, and we love each other unconditionally. 
And perhaps that's a word in season for us. When a person becomes a minister, the word temptation not removed from their lives or their vocabulary. They are as vulnerable as any other human being. And this American pastor reminds us that Satan is real and powerful and wants to bring Michelle down. He doesn't like it when things are going well in the church. And he will do anything he can to bring the minister down. He will stop at nothing. He will use greed and adultery and anger and addiction to catch a minister in his trap. And that's what it says in verse 7 um, of that reading that Abby read for us. It says, and for this purpose, no, 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 it doesn't. <laughs> He must also have a good reputation with outsiders so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. And this, Paul makes, has no doubt that the minister, that the, the devil is powerful and strong and real and sets traps for ministers. Sets traps for ministers. Last week, we heard a moving testimony from Nick about how Satan used addiction to prescription drugs that nearly destroyed the ministry of a good and a decent and a godly man but in the end God was stronger through the support of his, through some of his elders and his congregation but make no mistakes make no mistakes uh, God wants to bring Michelle down we must pray that it doesn't happen. This thing says that she must be of good reputation to outsiders. And I want to tell you something that Michelle is well known, well liked and well respected in this community. I've in the last couple of months had to conduct two funerals on her behalf because she was away. And these people were not church people at all. We got involved, the church got involved because of Michelle's uh, reputation in the, in the community. And that's marvellous. And, and, and that must continue, guys. And we must pray for that. And so this program asks us as good church members to each one of us, and this is what they ask, for five minutes, each one of us, for five minutes every day to pray for Michelle. To pray for her sermons, her family, and her protection. And I urge each one of us to do that. I've got to tell you that uh, preparing this has been an, an, a nightmare for me. Um, um, and so if I bored you today, then, I, then I'm sorry. Uh, but, but please blame Michelle because she handed me this assignment. <laughs> Which also requires that I deal with the qualities needed to be a good church member. And I want to be, I want to be, uh, uh, I want to keep that short because I think there's another, and I don't want to intrude in that, but... Uh, The key, I think, folks, to being a good church member, and that's what this teaching is about, is to be faithful. Faithful. Faithful in our quiet times and the reading of scriptures. And you know, that's so important to keep us near to God. And you can't get near to God if you're not in touch with Him in your quiet time and in your word. It's so important and yet so easily neglected. We're asked and we're needed to be faithful in prayer. Sometimes we feel our prayers are not important, but the Bible reminds us that every prayer, every prayer is powerful and is heard by God. Satan doesn't want you to pray for anybody, especially not for your minister. I want to invite you today to look nose at Satan and pray every day for your minister. To be a good church member requires us to be faithful in coming to worship on a Sunday morning where we minister to one another. 
with our presence. Did you see the hum when we greeted each other this morning? Wonderful. It's warm. There's a warm, there's a warmth in this church that, that the people bring. That the people bring. One of the it's most disheartening for a minister to stand up and find a half empty church. I've told you the story before, but it's worth repeating that Julie and I were on our way back from Bloemfontein once. So we'd been visiting a family. We left on a Sunday after lunch. And we, we stopped over that night and in Kronstadt. And we checked into the hotel. And on the notice board in the hotel was a notice to say that the Presbyterian Church had a service there on 6 or 6.30 on a Sunday evening. So we decided to go to that church. And we got there kind of just in time for the service. And, and there was one car outside thought well we probably got the time right and we went in to the church as it was about the service was about to begin and in their church there was a minister there was an organist one member folks it's the most miserable experience i've ever had in a church we belong together to worship together and then we're also required to be faithful in service. The American pastor reminds us that we are not part of the church for what we can get out of it, but we are part of the church to serve and to care for others. Our perspective, he says, should always be on giving and not receiving. And when you look at the elders, then you see that principle at work. They're all volunteers, our elders. They don't have to be there. They don't get paid to be there. They all have families to keep them busy. Most of them work full time. And yet despite the business of their busyness of their lives, they come out of their love for Jesus to serve this church. And it really is incumbent upon us as members to follow that example. Whether we like it or not, Michelle needs all of us. Her heart's desire is that this church should grow numerically, spiritually, and in service so that we might glow for God in the community but without our involvement and it ain't going to happen I've always said that you show me a successful minister one whose church is growing and vibrant and warm and dynamic and I'll show you a minister who has a, co a congregation of committed and involved members because a minister on his own can never do that And so, friends, uh, thankfully, oh, I, come to, I end with a second pledge, uh, which is on your, and it invites you to make this pledge. I will lead my family to be a good member of this church. We will pray together for our church. We will worship together in our church. We will serve together in our church. And we will ask Christ for help, for deeper love with this church, because he gave his life for them. And so, friends, the pledge, I end with... This is the pledge to be a good church member involves being faithful in our quiet time and our reading of the scriptures, in our prayer life, in our church attendance, in service. Will you make that your pledge today? Friends, we sang just now, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. May that be our, our wish. Okay, that's that's the end. I'm glad it's over, honestly. <laughs> and I'm sure and I'm sure you are too. Um, um.